Well, I'm sure you feel a little bit like I do. I'm humbled and proud in the right way, and I know Pastor Jeff would agree, to be partners with a man like Pastor Luis. And he's not the only one. We have several world partners in Mexico and Turkey and all over the world, and it's great to be part of a church family that cares enough to reach out to love and serve our neighbors, just as Pastor Luis and Open Door Ministries are doing in Mexico today. Well, many of you know that here at Chapel Street Church, we have a summer internship program called Leadership Institute. We believe we have a responsibility to identify and equip what we call next generation leaders in the church. In the summer, we have 13 uh, paid summer interns, mostly college students, and they're spread across all the ministry departments of our church, and they're just great. They're enthusiastic, they're learning, they're, they're just doing a great job, so it's a great thing to be a part of. But the whole idea of an internship program like this began in me a long, long time ago when I was a younger man, summer of 1982. Uh, when I uh, believed I was called into ministry, but I didn't really know how to get there, uh, what step to take next. But my dad had a pastor friend of his that was leading a church in inner city Pittsburgh, and he offered to let me come and just hang out at the church with them and serve in whatever way, whatever way I could for like seven weeks. So I did it. Spent seven weeks in inner city Pittsburgh. Lived in a small apartment in the church building. Ended up working with refugee families that came from Southeast Asia fleeing the war there with Hmong families. I worked with adolescent kids who had grown up in Southeast Asia, were now living in inner city Pittsburgh in the slum. And I'll always be grateful for what those Hmong kids and I learned together during those seven weeks. But the church building was located just across a city park from a region of the city that was uh, really pretty much a slum at that time. It's where most of the Hmong people lived. So it wasn't all that unusual for me to leave the church in the morning and see you know, several homeless men sleeping in the park. It was summertime, and that's where they would sleep. One morning, I got up early, was going to walk across the city park and get a donut at a coffee shop just across the way, and I noticed uh, a guy lying in kind of awkward position at the base of a tree right on the edge of the park. And at first, I didn't really pay attention, just another homeless guy sleeping it off. But something about the way, way he was lying just looked awkward, and it got my attention, so I decided to check it out. I walked a little closer, and the closer I got, the more kind of nervous, I felt a concern because he was really in an awkward position. I got closer, his skin looked kind of gray, like he might be cold, mouth is hanging open. I started thinking, well, what if he's not just sleeping? You know, I've watched a lot of crime shows, and so I'm thinking, what, do, do I give CPR? I don't know how to give CPR. Should I touch it? What if I leave fingerprints? Then I'm going to be a suspect. What do I do? I don't know what to do. I kept getting closer and closer, and finally I got down to, I leaned over, I wanted to see if his chest was moving at all. Nothing. I was pretty sure I found a dead guy. So I leaned really close. Hey, hey, buddy, you okay? Hey, nothing. Didn't even twitch. Finally got close enough to him, and I said it one more time. Hey, and he bolted awake with a violent twitch and shouted, ah, what are you doing? I, I jumped back, and I almost fell over. I was so scared. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm just trying to get a little sleep around here. I thought you were dead. Anyway, I backed away, apologized awkwardly, and spent the rest of the day trying to recover from thinking I found a dead guy. It didn't dawn on me until much later that I'd seen kind of a a parable of the spiritual truth we're going to look at today. We started the summer series last week called Uncomfortable Grace, and Pastor Jeff led off by saying, grace is that which we barely understand but desperately need. And we're going to study it all summer long. And today we're going to be in the letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul to a group of young Christians in a great city called Ephesus. And I'm going to show you this passage, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 on the screen. You'll notice I put some words in red. This is just my edition, so you'll notice them because they give you sort of the outline of Paul's thought as we go through. Follow along as I read. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following his desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, it's a beautiful text, one that perhaps you're familiar with, but let me start by pointing out that Paul begins with what I'm going to call an uncomfortable diagnosis. An uncomfortable diagnosis. Shortly after that summer experience in Pittsburgh, I decided to go to seminary. And part of my training in seminary was called Clinical Pastoral Education, CPE for short. I had to spend a semester or two serving as a volunteer chaplain in a large suburban hospital in Chicagoland. So when I got there, there were six or eight other seminarians from other seminaries all around Chicago who had to do the same thing. So we formed a little, a little group. And we would take turns serving in different wards, visiting people. And then once a week, we'd gather together for instruction and review. And we would also share a devotion with each other. So we took turns sharing a devotional thought with the group. When my turn came, I'd been reading a book by one of my favorite authors. The book was called The Alphabet of Grace. The author is Frederick Buechner. And I started with a quote, one of my favorite quotes. This is what I said um, verbatim. I said, here's the quote. I am a part-time novelist who happens also to be a part-time Christian because part of the time seems to be the most I can manage to live out my faith. Most of the time, I am indistinguishable from the rest of the herd that jostles and snuffles at the great trough of life. Part-time novelist, Christian pig. I love that quote. I followed it with a quote from Paul's own words in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the worst. That's what Paul said. And my main point was, I thought, very clear. That even those of us called to ministry, especially those of us called to pastor and care for others, need to always be aware of our deep need for the grace of Christ in our lives. So I thought my devotional was pretty good. After the devotionals, we always had a time of feedback, so I sat back to let the relentlessly positive feedback just roll in. <laughs> Not so much. They weren't positive. In fact, they were, they were angry. I mean, really angry. One lady shocked me. She was just, her voice was like trembling with rage. She said, how, how dare you? How dare you insinuate that I'm a sinner? I've spent my life devoted to helping others. How dare you? Even the supervisor called me on the carpet for what he called my inappropriate assumption about someone else's sinfulness. I tried to explain it really wasn't my idea. That, it, that was the Apostle Paul. It was the heart of the gospel, but it didn't make any difference. They were mad at me, and they stayed mad at me pretty much the whole semester. Now, looking back, I think two things were going on. First of all, the choice of using a quote with the word pig in it wasn't very wise. The group was made up mostly of women. Secondly, this was a group of people, I think, that had become convinced of their own goodness and their own moral superiority. So when I even suggested that deep down we're all selfish and sinful people, they bristled and they didn't like that diagnosis very much at all. The Apostle Paul here is writing to young Christians in the church at Ephesus. Now Ephesus, give you a little background, was one of the most important cities of the ancient Roman Empire, located in what is modern day Turkey. Uh, it was sort of a crossroads of cultures and commerce, kind of like the New York City of the ancient world. Affluent, uh, but it was dominated by the great temple of Artemis which uh, this is an artist's conception of what it would look like, covered more than a football field, uh, made of pure marble, over 120 columns, 60 feet tall, one of the w seven wonders of the ancient world. All that's left of it today is this one lone column. And several of us in the room here have been to Turkey and seen this. That's all that's left today, some 2,000 years later. So these Ephesian Christians had grown up in a culture dominated by the worship of a pagan fertility goddess. They believed that Artemis gave them prosperity, gave them life, uh, that, that, and their worship, many scholars believe, included the practice of cult prostitution. And when Paul was in their city a couple of years before, he'd gotten into a confrontation with these artisans who made the little idols and sold them for profit, idols of the, of the, the goddess. And it caused a riot, and Paul almost lost his life. You can read about that in Acts chapter 19. But he's simply reminding them that despite the wealth and prosperity of their city, despite their great temple, they were at once far from the God that they didn't even know. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. See, the reason my little CPE group of some seminarians was upset 
besides the pig thing, is that no one likes to admit they're dead, spiritually speaking. Oh, we'll say, we'll admit, you know, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. I could be a little kinder. I could be a little more generous. I could be a little more honest. But, but I'm certainly not a sinner. And I'm certainly not dead. We're kind of like the, a guy who goes uh, to his, the emergency room. He's got all the symptoms of a heart attack. Shortness of breath, chest pains, everything. He gets to the emergency room. The doctor looks at him and goes, yes, indeed, you are having a heart attack. I'm going to need to perform emergency bypass surgery. And he goes, I can't, I, I'm, so, I'm so offended. How can you have put, put your standards of physical health on me? Nobody does that, right? When you go to your doctor, even if the diagnosis is uncomfortable, you want to know the truth so you can pursue the right treatment plan, the right remedy. So what are the symptoms of spiritual death? Paul says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following his desires and thought. He lays it out for us. Here are the symptoms. First, following the ways of this world. That simply means allowing the culture around you to define truth instead of the other way around. Allowing the culture to define your view of God, yourself, and the world, to allow the culture to shape your beliefs, your attitudes, and behavior, to, in essence, to allow the culture to take the place of God. Secondly, he says, and to follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's a weird phrase. What's he talking about? This is a very interesting reference to Satan himself. The ruler of the kingdom of the air. The same being that showed up in Genesis as the serpent who tempted and lied to and deceived Adam and Eve. The father of lies. This is the one, the author of sin and death, who seeks to destroy all God made as good. And Paul says his presence, his malevolence is so pervasive, it fills the whole atmosphere of our culture. The air that we breathe. And finally he says, and all of us were there at one time. All of us were gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. He sums it all up. Paul says the final symptom is allowing our physical desires, our cravings, to drive our behavior and our morality. That is, the prince of the power of the air has convinced us that all our desires are good and therefore should be pursued. Does that sound familiar to you? It should because that's the culture we live in today, 2,000 years later. Now, I want you to notice that spiritual death is not that a person is unable to do some good things. That's not it. If you ask the average person later today walking in your neighborhood, hey, I've got a question for you. What do you think God wants from you, wants of you? Most people in our culture will say, well, he wants me to be a pretty good person. He wants me to be good. And I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anybody. I'm a pretty good person. Those people in my seminary group, were good people. They were doing a lot of good things, but that's not the point. That's not the issue. That's not what Paul's talking about. He says the symptoms of spiritual death have to do with being unaware of the presence and holiness of God himself. Therefore, you're unaware of the depth of your own sinfulness. You think of yourself as being pretty good. And therefore, you're unaware that your priorities, your values, your decisions, your life itself is being shaped by the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And so you're unaware of the disease that's eating away at your own soul. And the result, Paul says, is, like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. That word wrath is kind of a Bible word. We often tend to think of it as anger. You know, we do something bad, God gets mad, throws a lightning bolt at us, that's as far as we go. But wrath is a much richer word than anger. Wrath means to live in opposition to or denial of the holy God. To live in opposition to God. I think of wrath like this. God is holy, the Bible says. And his holiness, and no analogy is perfect, but to me is a little like electricity. Electricity is a powerful force. It gives us all sorts of good things, lights and air conditioning and all sorts of good things. But if I approach electricity frivolously, if I approach electricity arrogantly, carelessly, let's say I go home today and I stick a fork in an outlet, what happens? I experience the wrath of electricity. It doesn't hate me, but it is electricity. And its nature never changes. 
Well, God's holiness is a little bit like that. Last week, Pastor Jeff said that the grace of God is uncomfortable because grace begins with truth. And truth is often uncomfortable. Here's Paul's uncomfortable diagnosis. You were dead and deserving of wrath. But then he moves on to offer what I'm calling an uncomfortable remedy. An uncomfortable remedy. I, this might be hard for you to believe, but I once competed in a triathlon. Are there any other triathletes out here? Anybody ever do a triathlon? No one? Get going, people. Let's go. It wasn't a big one. It wasn't one of the big Ironman ones. It was a little small mini triathlon. It took a couple hours up in Crystal Lake. You know, I had to swim a half mile, bike 18 miles, and run six miles. My brother and I, for some reason, decided to do this together. So he trained in Ohio for six months. I trained here for six months. And then we did the race. And in the training, I kind of enjoyed the biking and the running at that time. The swimming, however, I hated swimming. I made myself do it. I mean, to me, swimming is like go from here, one time down, hang on to the side, that's it, right? Just swim one time. I could swim. But I had to make myself swim for like a half an hour without stopping. And I hated it, but I did it because my brother was doing it, and I didn't want to lose to him in the race, right? So I did the swimming. Day comes of the race. It's June 9th in Crystal Lake. The first hint that I was in trouble was we get to the parking lot there, and all the other triathletes show up, and they're all, a whole bunch of them are wearing wetsuits. We're like, <laughs> check out the wetsuits. What's the wetsuits? Pansies, you know, wetsuits. They line us all up. Race starts. We race into the water, and the water temperature was 68 degrees. I had no idea. That doesn't sound very cold, but that's cold enough that it sucks the, your air right out of your lungs. I hyperventilated within like 30 seconds. So I can't breathe. Then I was unprepared for the violence of the first 50 meters. I mean, people are grabbing your legs and pulling you under the water, swimming over top of you, kicking you in the face and the head. They don't care. I had several, like, felonies committed against me just in the first 50 yards. <laughs> so they all go by me, and I end up, I'm like five minutes into the race, I'm doing a weird version of a dog paddle and a side, I'm just trying to survive. And just then, a rowboat comes up next to me, a guy in a rowboat comes up next to me. He's a race marshal. He's got a hat on, T-shirt. He goes, hey, buddy. Had enough? I'm five minutes in. I didn't even realize what he was asking me at first. Then I realized he's trying to rescue me from a watery death. And I go, it's okay, I'm good, I'm good. The truth was, I wasn't so good. But I was too proud to surrender. I ended up finishing the race, but there is a spiritual analogy there. Because what that race marshal offered was really, in a way, uncomfortable grace. Paul writes, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, before we get into the uncomfortable remedy, I want to point out two words that I put in red. But God. This is the story of the story of God from front to back. But God. We studied it all last year. In the garden, in Genesis, Adam and Eve Listen to the temptation of the serpent. They eat from the tree. They realize they're naked, and in shame they hide from their God. But God made coverings for them. The world descended into chaos and violence and evil and deserved judgment, but God delivered Noah and his family. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt, but God protected him and caused him to prosper. The people of Israel were captive in Egypt for 400 years, but God delivered them by the blood of a lamb. Centuries later, the people of Israel clung to the law and to the sacrifices, but God sent his own son. And you and I were dead, but God made us alive in Christ. Now, the New Testament describes salvation in several beautiful images. The first is adoption. We were once orphans, separated from God. He adopts us into his family. The second is redemption. We were once slaves who have been purchased back by the blood of Christ. And the third most powerful is moving from death to life. Jesus says in John chapter 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is the gospel. The gospel is not about becoming a better person. The gospel is not about moral improvement turning over a new life, a little better self-discipline, cleaning up your act. Those are all good things, and the gospel produces those things. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about death and resurrection. Paul leaves no wiggle room here. 
He doesn't say you were kind of sick. He doesn't say even for you Princess Bride fans, you were mostly dead. He doesn't say you were taken to the principal's office. He doesn't say uh, you uh, need a little religion in your life. He says you were dead. Spiritually speaking, you were dead. And you've been made alive again by the power of Christ's death and resurrection. Now, how does that work? What's the engine? What's the force? What's the energy that makes that work? Twice he says, by grace you have been saved. The word translated grace is the Greek word charis, from which we get our words charismatic or charity. And the basic meaning is gift. Theologians like to say grace is unmerited favor. Jeff talked about this last weekend. That kind of rubs us the wrong way in our culture. Because our whole culture is about getting what you deserve, right? I want what I deserve. I want my rights. If I work hard, keep my nose clean, I should be rewarded for that. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Grace is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do deserve. Because grace is a gift. It's a gift. Cannot be earned. Cannot be deserved. Can only be received. Now notice, grace is a gift given out of God's incomparable riches. Incomparable riches. He's got so much that it never comes to an end. Here's the gospel. We are moved from death, spiritual death to spiritual life by faith in the gift of God. Jeff said, grace is not an idea. It's not a concept. It's a person. Jesus Christ is the grace that saves us. So how is this uncomfortable? I said uncomfortable remedy. How is it uncomfortable? Well, because we can't save ourselves. You can't save yourself. You know, I'm good. I can make it. Just at some point, you just surrender. You've got to surrender and get in the boat. Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. That's the uncomfortable remedy. And then he wraps up with what I'm calling the uncomfortable prognosis. I wanted to keep it the medical theme here. I had to look up prognosis, see what it meant. It means the likely outcome of a course of treatment. The likely outcome. Paul finishes his thought with these words, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now the temptation here is to read this and focus immediately on that phrase, good works. Okay, I got it. Jesus wants me to be good. I'll do good things. I'll impress him with how good I am. No, that's not the point. We've already seen that's not what he's saying. Look at the first thing he says. We are God's handiwork. That is, we are his workmanship. He does something in us first. Have you ever had someone, I've had someone say this to me more than once, you're a real piece of work. <laughs> someone says that to you, you can say, yes, I am. <laughs> we are God's piece of work, created by God for relationship with him, but dead in our sins, but God made us alive, recreated us in Christ. We are God's piece of work. The phrase in Christ means we have new identity. No longer defined by our culture. No longer defined by the ruler of the kingdom of the air. No longer defined by our failures and sin. No longer even defined by our own goodness. Defined only by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And only then do we see the phrase to do good works. And here's where this gets a little uncomfortable. Because once we know the grace of Christ, once we've moved from death to life by his gift, our lives no longer belong to us. We are no longer able to live for ourselves, for our kingdoms, for our purposes. We've been given new life, new identity, and new purpose. And that new purpose calls us to share the incomparable riches of his grace with a world that is broken, dead, and even dangerous. That's why we have people with Pastor Luis this morning in Mexico. That's why we have kids up in Milwaukee. That's why we do vacation Bible school and buddy break and RFKC. That's why we have served with the world partners locally and globally. Not because we're trying to do good things to impress God with our goodness so he likes us more. No. Because once we experience the incomparable and uncomfortable riches of his grace, we can't help ourselves. Because our lives are no longer ours. They're his. And we exist in him to do his work and to move toward the brokenness that's all around us. Would you bow as I close today?
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the clarity of your truth. Thank you for your grace. Undeserved, unending, sometimes uncomfortable. And may the purity and power of your grace burn away both our self-righteousness and our self-condemnation. And may we discover who we are in you. And may we become ambassadors of your grace in this world. We pray these things in your name.